we're living in this sort of 10% world. No matter what you're studying or the metric, it turns out that when you look back in time, it used to be about 90% more <laughs> of that thing. So the fish used to be 90% bigger. Um, we used to catch 90% more um, big fish. There used to be 90% more coral, whatever it is. The world that we're living in is an order of magnitude less um, than it was you know, several generations ago. I spent about 18 months of my PhD just going from archive to archive. I was looking for anything that would give a clue about long-term change. I went to a small archive in Key West, Florida that had a really knowledgeable archivist there. He brought out this stack of photos that show people catching these massive fish from the 1950s on. This is from um, 1958 uh, in Key West, Florida. Um, so this, you know, it was immediately clear that things were different. And so I used those photos to, to measure change in the size and the species that were caught over time and found that there was a 90% loss of the size of these large fish over 50 years. Um, so sort of a, a very visual example of the shifted baseline. Hey, everyone. I'm here to talk to you a bit today about time, uh, shifting baseline syndrome, a phenomenon of lowered expectations in which each generation, so we're talking generational change here, regards a progressively poorer natural world as normal. This comes from fishery science in the 1990s, Daniel Pauly coined the term, um, but it really can be applied to many ways in which we're remaking the world around us, especially when it comes to environmental change. It's been called a type of forgetting, a type of amnesia even. It's an inability to truly see and to feel and to process slow moving changes in the natural world. I'm a journalist and a filmmaker who focuses primarily on the climate crisis and has for a number of years now. And I think this idea is especially troubling when you think about this challenge. We know that we're burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, and that that is putting this sort of blanket around the planet and heating it up and causing all sorts of problems, um, making this world more dangerous. But what does it feel like? We know that is true, but what does that feel like in our day-to-day -day lives? Um, on uh, my Lyft ride to the airport, uh, from the airport here in Dallas, actually, I started talking to the Lyft driver um, about this question, is today unusually hot? And she said the weather here in Dallas recently has felt like sort of calling out Powerball numbers. It's like 73, 24, 58, like you never know what's coming. <laughs> and so if I were to ask you today, does today feel unusually hot to, to you? I would imagine a number of you would just sort of not know. How do we sort of plot ourselves as part of these long-term trends. I want to tell you about one study that sort of got at this, how we process the weather in a day-to-day -day kind of way. Um, this is Fran Moore, uh, who's a professor at UC Davis in California. And she was really interested, again, in sort of how we make sense of temperature. Um, and she looked at what I think is probably the most interesting place to do this research. It's a place where people love to complain about everything, including the weather. And that place, of course, is Twitter. So she analyzed tens of thousands of tweets over a, a many year period and looked at what the actual weather data said versus the way that people perceived that and the way that they talked about it on social media. And what she found, I think, is, is, is really insightful and interesting. It's that we only have about a two to eight year window, a two to eight year memory that we're accessing when we decide what we think about today's weather. So think about that. If we're the people um, in those photos with the fish, those fishermen are smiling just as big now as they were in 1950 when the fish were as tall as they were. We, when we think about the weather, are only accessing last year's catch, the year before that, when we decide how we feel about what's happening today. And this is something that's really upsetting to me because I spend a lot of my time and my career up really close to the climate crisis. This is a family I met about a year ago on a, a story for CNN in Honduras. Um, one member of this family fled towards the north because of an unprecedented drought that was happening in the dry corridor of Central America. I'm sure you heard about the caravan. Drought and climate change were part of that story. This is from the Marshall Islands a few years ago. This is a country out in the middle of the Pacific, about five hours by plane west of Hawaii, that is so low-lying 
that the amount of sea level rise that we're expecting even this century could render the entire country uninhabitable. This is from Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. I spent a lot of time there doing investigative work um, for CNN. This is a home that someone was living in you know, several months after the storm and still didn't have a roof. So I bring up these examples just to, to give you a hint at why this is so important to me. I think that there is a, an underappreciated and untold story of real like human tragedy and suffering that is linked to our inability to, to end the fossil fuel era. And I'm, I'm very troubled by this idea that we would normalize it, that one storm hitting after the next, one wildfire after the next, one drought after the next, that this would become... It would always trouble us, of course, but that we would fail to see like the true magnitude of the changes that we're unleashing on the planet. Of course, like we have the data to know what's going on, and we have for a really long time. This is Charles David Keeling, um, who at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego um, was sort of the first person to start measuring the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and then to attribute that to fossil fuel use. We can see from maps like this one from NASA that you know, we know what's happening with global temperature. On, you know, we've driven up global temperatures about one degree Celsius since the Industrial Revolution. But we don't always talk about it in that way, and I think if you really look at the conversation we have in the media and with each other, um, we don't recognize the true magnitude of what's happening. This is a newspaper um, from 1988 when James Hansen, uh, then a NASA scientist, famously testified in front of the U.S. Senate and said the era of global warming had begun. Here are some examples from a book um, called Don't Even Think About It, in which environmental groups in 1990, 2007, 2015, they're sort of trying to sound the alarm here. They're saying there are 5,000 days to save the planet, 10 years to save the planet. We keep pushing these deadlines forward through time. And I've been part of that problem. Like, this is an article I wrote for CNN in 2015 ahead of the Paris Climate Talks saying 100 days to save the world. I hadn't read that George Marshall book yet, and I hadn't realized how often we sort of fall into this trap of creating deadlines on a problem that is very slow moving and intergenerational in its nature. Yet we know, you know, again, from science that emissions continue to rise while we have this conversation that in some ways is going in circles. So I've spent a lot of time in the last year especially really asking like, okay, what's the antidote here? I think journalists are an especially big part of this problem, right? We live in the now moment. We, we write about stories in a tweet to tweet, minute to minute kind of way. We rarely step back to look at the, the big picture of what's happening. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna break outside my own profession and spend some time with other people, including this guy, John O'Keefe, who is a researcher at the Harvard Forest in Massachusetts, and he's one of a number of people in the hard scientists who practice what's known as longitudinal research, so watching a problem over a number of years or even decades. And John, about 30 years ago, um, he just decided to start taking really detailed notes about the forest where he works. And it wasn't really for any particular reason other than that he liked, liked taking walks in this forest. And he thought, oh, you know, I'm, I know this place as well as anyone, and I want to, you know, start taking these notes. So all of a sudden, you have, you know, 30 years of records, and this is the most important data about how climate change has altered this forest in the Northeast that exists. And so the, the two things I take away from him are that, one, watching really closely, being a person who knows a place really well, and then continuing that observation in a regimented way over a long period of time, that that adds a sort of value and can help us counteract this idea that our baselines are always shifting. There are also some examples from the arts, not as many. Um, this is a trailer for a film series that's called The Up Series, or 7-Up, by Michael Apted. Um, he, in the 1960s, interviewed a bunch of seven-year-old kids in London, uh, where he was living at the time, and then he followed up with those same kids every seven years basically until the present. The most recent edition of this film series called 63 Up came out last year, and those kids that were seven are now 63. Um, he was 21 when he started making that series. He's now 77. And I'm showing this to you because I think that there's something really nostalgic and powerful and emotional about watching a person age on film. I think that you get a sense of like the magnitude of a life by seeing these images and hearing these interviews that you would miss if you talk to them at any one point in time. 
And so I'm adapting these ideas and creating a film series that I'm calling Baseline. And the idea is to sort of do the climate version of that 7-Up series, to revisit four locations on the front lines of the climate crisis every five years until the year 2050, to try to put a finger on this idea of shifting baselines and to try to help us see time and the climate crisis in a different way. Um, so I want to introdu introduce you just to, to one of these places. It's a village in Alaska. Um, it's a place where the permafrost has been thawing and the sea ice is melting so rapidly that one house actually fell off the edge of this village and into the water, and where the community is, is, has been wrestling for a number of years now with this idea that they may have to relocate. I first visited Trishmaref in 2009 on a story for CNN, and it seemed at that point like relocation might be imminent. It's something that they're still really struggling with today. I want to introduce you to just one couple in this place. Today is May 20, right? 22nd today? I don't know. May, tw May 22nd? Yeah. If the time was still the same way, like this from long ago, you'll be driving snow goes and dog teams and stuff like that. Just lots of snow yet, huh? Mm hmm. <laughs> They want to relocate, I don't know where, someplace, the cluster, I think. Yeah. Okay. Cluster Lagoon, I don't know. Huh? Maybe we'll be gone by the time they relocate the town, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so there was lots of ground then, that time. Lots of ground. Yeah, lots of ground. Hardly any, any, any ground now. Yeah, we're right down the edge now. Yeah. 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 So this is Shelton and Clara Kakiak, and one thing I really love about this place is the way that stories are passed through time. Um, it's a tradition in this village and in many parts of the Arctic um, for uh, when a new child is born, they traditionally take the name of the most recent person to have passed away in that place. So it's not necessarily about your, you know, your blood relative and naming a child after that. It's about naming someone in the village after someone who recently passed away. And it's the way I think of it, and after talking to people there about it a lot, it, it's almost a form of reincarnation. You hear stories about you know, kids running around in the village with a name of an elder that recently died, and that kid it sort of takes on all the attributes that that person who passed away had, and people almost talk to them like they are that older person. I mean, it's an incredibly rich um, um, tradition and ritual. And this is really important for Shelton and Clara because their son, Norman, um, fell through the sea ice in 2007 on a hunting trip and passed away. And there are a few children, a couple children in this village who are named Norman, including the, the boy you see on the right here, um, after him and who carry that story through time. I think it's an incredibly poetic way in which they fight this idea of of you know, us missing generational change. Stories there, people there, are passed across generational lines and through time. And so you know, in this series, I'm asking big questions about what happens to this village, what happens um, to the, the young people who live there, what future um, are they inheriting? Um, and again, trying to, think, uh, trying to trigger a new sort of thinking about time and to stretch our collective memory. I was talking to a scientist the other day, actually just a, a couple weeks ago, um, who was telling me that about 40 to 50% of the emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere right now, that those emissions will stay with us in the atmosphere and in the oceanic systems for a thousand years, half of them. So if you think about that, that's the year 3020, the 31st century. That is, it, it sounds sci-fi, right? It sounds made up. But I think that we are truly smart enough to outthink the climate crisis. We can start to think in different timescales than we're used to. 
and we can realize that we exist in that future, right? When I first heard that, I, I thought that was almost like paralyzing, right? Like the pollution that we're creating now will have ramifications for a thousand years. But you can flip that around and you can see a lot of hope, right? Which is that when we decide to end the fossil fuel era, when we fix this crisis, those actions will matter a thousand years from now. Thank you. Thank you.